Listener warning. This story contains many deaths. These deaths include suffocation, decapitation, suicide, death by terrorism and the end of the world. Listener discretion is advised. You are Ant by Ross Sutherland. A choose your own adventure talking tape. Hi, my name is Ross Sutherland. I'm the author of this story. Before we start, let me just explain how this story works. Released on both book and cassette, You Are Ant is a read along at home experience. That means as you listen to the story, you can also follow along with the words at home. Whenever you hear this sound, that's when it's time to turn the page. In addition to being a talking tape, this book is also a choose your own adventure story. That means throughout the story, you get to help our hero decide what to do next. The choices you make will affect the outcome of the story. So, think carefully. Depending on the choices you make, the story will continue on a different page of the book. For example, to buy a hot dog, turn to page 32. Or, to close your eyes and step into traffic, turn back to page 9. Simply turn to the correct page when prompted and keep reading. Right now, you might be thinking, hey, how the fuck am I supposed to flick back and forth through this book, reading all the pages out of order, when the story is being simultaneously presented on a cassette tape, which is a fundamentally linear medium? Well, that's a really good question. But sadly, it's not my problem. Why not talk to someone else, like someone who cares? In the meantime, let's begin. You are Ant by Ross Sutherland. You are Ant. You are walking a long straight road that will eventually lead you home. The trees are covered in snow. It's Christmas again. So much has happened this year. You can barely remember who you were last Christmas. You almost feel like a different person entirely. Clutched tight to your chest, your Garfield notebook. You should really put the notebook in your rucksack. Then you could put your gloves on and warm up a bit. But then again, what if it was something you wanted to write down? You always like to keep your notebook out, just in case you have an idea for a story. You never know when something might pop into your head, or how quickly it might leave again. On the walk home, you stop and look at your school, watching the lights turning off one by one. The air is cold and fresh. It feels like the kind of day where even the tiniest, most arbitrary of decisions might just change your life forever. Arriving home, your mum calls your name. Anthony! You walk into the front room to find mum sitting in front of the Christmas tree, surrounded by decorations. It's the same plastic tree you have every year, and sure... It's seen better days, but it's always exciting to see it again, like an old friend. Hey, Trouble, says Mum. It's that time again. It's fun to give me a hand. You cross the room carefully, trying not to stand on any of the decorations. You put your Garfield notebook on the carpet next to Mum and sit on it. Sadly, says Mum, I think we've lost the usual 
star. Can you help me choose a replacement? I just can't decide. You look across the floor. Three possible options present themselves. First, you notice a small ceramic angel. Your dad bought it for you last Christmas. He told you it was your guardian angel and would always be looking out for you. Which was a cheesy thing to say, but you let him off because it was Christmas and it clearly meant a lot to him. Next, you notice a wonky homemade star made out of clothes pegs held together with silver paint. You remember mum once telling you that she made it when she was your age in school. The star has never been on the tree before, as far as you can remember. Finally, your eyes move beyond the decorations towards the toy chest in the corner. Your little brother's favourite robot is resting against the edge of the box. Every year, your brother tries to hide the robot in the tree somewhere. Every year, mum finds it and takes it out again, but maybe this year... Scotty could finally get his wish. Well, says Mum, what do you think? What decoration shall you put on top of the tree? To choose your father's angel, turn to page two. To choose your brother's toy robot, turn to page three. To choose your mother's homemade star, turn to page five. Page two. You pick up your father's angel and place it on top of the tree. Mum wipes a single tear from her eye. That's very thoughtful of you, Aunt, she says. Do you know what? I think that's very much the right choice. You turn around to see Dad and Scotty standing in the doorway. Wow says Scotty. Everyone agrees that the tree has never looked more lovely. Now, turn to page six. Page three. You pick up your brother's toy robot and place it on top of the tree. Mum wipes a solitary tear from her eye. That's very thoughtful of you, Aunt, she says. Do you know what? I think that's very much the right choice. You turn around to see Dad and Scotty standing in the doorway. Great, says Scotty. Everyone agrees that the tree has never looked more lovely. Now, turn to page six. Page four. Stealing your nerves, you jam the sawn-off shotgun barrel into the gorilla's mouth and pull the trigger. The creature's head explodes like a bomb, showering the spaceship control room in viscera. The shard of the gorilla's jawbone strikes you in the chest, slashing the fabric of your spacesuit. Blood and oxygen hiss from the wound. You begin to lose consciousness. The room swells, forcing you to your knees. You don't even hear the countdown reach zero. Through the view screen, planet Earth explodes into an orb of deadly light, like an eyeball without a pupil. Everyone is dead. The human race has been extinguished. The truth tears through your mind like a propeller through paper. You jam the shotgun barrel into your mouth to stifle your cries of despair. Then blow out your brains like a party popper filled with slugs and chutney. You are dead. The end. Page five. You pick up your mother's homemade star and place it on top of the tree. Mum wipes an individualistic tear from her eye. That's very thoughtful of you, Aunt, 
she says. Do you know what? I think that's very much the right choice. You turn around to see Dad and Scotty standing in the doorway. Nice, says Scotty. Everyone agrees that the tree has never looked more lovely. Now, turn to page six. Page six. Together, you finish decorating the tree. Christmas passes so fast, you feel like you can barely hold on to it. The days are so short, there's barely time to do anything. And soon, the conversation turns to school again. So much for having an adventure, you think. One snowy night, you put on a woolly jumper and go sit on the swing in the back garden. It's a nice, quiet place. Good for doing some writing in your Garfield notebook. The swing was built by the people who lived here before you. The wood is soft now and covered in snail trails. Dad has warned you not to swing on it, but it still works okay as a seat. You pause your writing, take your Swiss army knife, out of your pocket and carve a notch into the flaky wood. What was that? A rustle from the bushes. You jump off the swing and listen for another sound. No, nothing. Maybe you imagined it. You turn back to resume your carving, but then you hesitate. The wooden frame is riddled with notches. You've cut so many grooves into this wood over the years, you can't remember which one you were working on. Still got that knife, I see, calls Dad, walking down the garden. He stands awkwardly for a second, pretending to look up at the stars. A Anthony, says Dad, I just wanted to... You've been a little distant recently, and... We were worried that maybe you were having problems in school or something. We worry about you sometimes. No, you say. Everything's fine, asks Dad. Everything's fine, you say. Okay, says Dad. Well, we worry about you sometimes. Then he goes back inside. Another rustle from the bushes. Right over in the far corner of the garden, you strain your eyes and can just make out the head of a fox poking through the rhododendrons. No, not just a fox. The fox. This fox has been in your garden before. His poo made your dog, Gareth, really sick. Gareth had to spend a night at the vets in the inn. Mum and Dad have told you, if you ever see that fox in the garden again, you have to throw something at it. For Gareth's sake, you need to quickly chase it away. You look at the fox's face, his whiskers catching the moonlight. It looks like the face of an animal just about to relinquish a poo. The Swiss Army knife is still in your hand. To pick up a smooth stone and hurl that at the fox, turn to page seven. To throw your knife at the fox, turn to page eight. To confront the fox with your bare hands, turn to page 25. Page 7. You decide to throw a smooth stone. However, as soon as you pull back your hand to throw the object, the fox jumps away through the back fence and vanishes. Now, turn to page 10. Page 8. You decide to throw your Swiss army knife. Obviously, before you throw it, you... Retract the blade, 
so you don't accidentally hurt the creature. However, as soon as you pull back your hand to throw the object, the fox jumps away through the back fence and vanishes. Now, turn to page 10. Page 9. You lift the mug of acid to your lips and drink, hoping that the vampire blood you ingested earlier will protect you. The man in the ski mask lowers his harpoon gun. Thank you for complying with my request, he says. The funny thing is, if you'd poured that acid onto the power generator in front of you, my doomsday machine would have been destroyed. But instead, you chose to drink it. <laughs> what kind of an idiot drinks acid? You look down to see your shirt has turned bright red. Oh, and by the way, says the man in the ski mask, there's no such thing as vampires. I just paid a guy to wear a cloak and talk like this. Thankfully, the nuclear bomb turns you both to sublimated particles before your body even hits the floor. The end. Page 10. Now that the fox is gone, you head over and check the rhododendron bush where the fox had been originally hiding. What you find down there is pretty much what you expected, fox poo. You grab it, feeling it squish between your fingers. Then you go and drop it in the wheelie bin. No tummy aches for Gareth tonight, you think. You turn back towards the house to see both mum and dad looking at you through the back window, sharing a weird expression you can't understand. Before you know it, you're back in school again. Despite what mum and dad might think, you don't mind school that much, particularly once the weather turns nice again and you can spend lunch times on the school field no one really gives you any hassle. You have a couple of mates. You never really fall out except over football. You don't like school, but you don't hate it either. Each night, you get the same barrage of questions from mum and dad. Is everything okay at school? Do you want to talk about it? Why don't you want to talk about it? The scrutiny is exhausting. All because last year... You accidentally kicked Jeremy Bagshaw in the arse whilst running down a flight of stairs. They just can't stop bringing it up. Mum put a lavender air freshener in your room to help with stress, she told you. She read it on her website. The stink got into all of your clothes and now Daniel Anson has given you the nickname My Lovely Grandma. Not that it bothers you. Last time he said it, you pulled out a tin of boiled sweets and started handing them around the class. You can own being a lovely grandma. Who doesn't want to be a lovely grandma? Turn to page 12. Page 11. You decide to pull the left lever. Blades shoot down from the ceiling, perforating your skull like the film on a microwave dinner. You are dead. The end. Page 12. The school term passes pretty uneventfully. Until one afternoon, just before the summer holidays, everyone is packing up their desks when Mr Canning calls your name out. Anthony, I need you to stay behind, okay? The rest of the class turned to look at you. Don't worry about telling your parents. I've already informed them. They're on their way in too. Something in Mr Canning's tone makes your heart skip a beat. Then, 
you notice it. Sitting on Mr. Canning's desk, your golf, your notebook. The rest of the class pick up their bags and leave with the bell. It's nothing to worry about, Anthony, says Mr. Canning. I just wanted to chat with your parents about some of the stories you've been writing. In here, he taps the book. I, uh, I don't know if you've been watching uh, some inappropriate films or whether it's something you picked up from your computer games, but, um, Mr. Canning flicks through the pages. Everything is okay at home, isn't it, Anthony? Yeah, you say. It's fine. Your face starts to turn red. <clears throat> you just have some very violent stories in here. Stories about dying, about the world ending, about being tortured. You have no idea what Mr. Canning is talking about. You don't remember writing anything like that. That's not me, you say. I don't write any stories about dying or anything. But this is your book, isn't it? Yeah, you say. But I didn't write any stories about that stuff. Maybe my little brother wrote something in there. Or, I don't know. He slams the book shut. Okay, we'll just wait for your parents to get here. You feel the heat rising from your body. Something is not right about this. You don't write violent stories. You're not meant to be here. You've fallen into another world. This is meant for some other kid, not you. But who though? Who could have written those stories in your book? You barely ever let that book out of your sight. If there's something in there, you say to Mr. Canning, it's not me. It, mu it must be my little brother. Ant, I know your handwriting. You feel a churning in your stomach. Once mum and dad hear about this, there's going to be no way back. Each night will be an inquisition. They're never going to leave you alone ever again. Mr. Canning has this look on his face like he thinks you're about to run. Like he's preparing himself to grab you. You start backing away. I'm just going to go home and ask my little brother, you say. And hang on, says Mr. Canning. You turn and walk out of the classroom. And the corridors have already cleared. Come back a second. The school is empty. You quickly reach the front door. But the caretaker has already locked it. You turn and head upstairs to the dining hall. Your feet skidding across the newly mopped floor. Canning isn't far behind. You can hear him on the stairs already. You need to get out of here. You need to get some thinking space away from this school. And away from your parents too. Discarding the door that Mr. Canning is approaching, there are two other exits from the dining hall. To take the right exit and escape through the headmaster's office, turn to page 13. To take the left exit and escape through the gymnasium, turn to page 14. Page 13. You take the right exit from the dining hall. Flying down the central stairwell, you accidentally kick Jeremy Bagshaw in the arse. He tumbles down the final few steps. Damn Jeremy, you think, as you jump over his body. This is starting to look personal. Knowing that the headmaster always leaves his window open, you throw open the door to his office. But, upon entering, you immediately stop in your tracks. Mum and Dad are sitting right there in the middle of the office, having a cup of tea with the headmaster. Ah, here he is now, says the headmaster. Anthony, says Mum, rising from her seat. Your headmaster has been telling us about your stories, about everything. Don't worry, Anthony, you're not in trouble, says the headmaster. We're just concerned. Mum leans down and puts her arms around you. In her hands, you notice some leaflets. Turn to page 16. Page 14. 
you take the left exit from the dining hall. Flying down the back stairwell, you accidentally kick Jeremy Bagshaw in the arse. He tumbles down the final few steps. Damn, Jeremy, you think as you jump over his body. This is starting to look personal. Knowing that the back door onto the school field can always be opened from the inside, you run into the gymnasium. But upon entering, you immediately stop in your tracks. Mum and Dad are standing right there in the middle of the gymnasium, shooting a couple of basketballs with the headmaster. Anthony, says Mum. We were just coming to see you. Your head teacher was just giving us a quick tour of the school first. Seeing your parents standing there in the middle of the gym, a place that they have no reason to be, your dad giving you his best sympathetic expression whilst awkwardly holding a basketball that you'd quite like to put down, Something inside your head breaks like a fired pot filled with air bubbles. There is no doubt in your mind now. Something is coming for you. Every decision you have ever been given was a decision that was already made for you. You realise that now. Something is coming and no path exists that can take you away from it. Don't worry, says Mum, approaching. Your head teacher has already told us about your stories, about everything. Don't worry, Anthony, says the head teacher. You're not in trouble. We're just concerned. Mum leans down and puts her arms around you. In her hands, you notice some leaflets. Now turn to page 16. Page 15. You yank the samurai sword off the wall and use it to sever the straps on Cecilia's bomb harness. I hope you know what you're doing, says Cecilia. The harness drops to the floor and explodes, propelling both of you into the ceiling like a couple of bags of soggy raspberries. You are both dead. The end. Page 16. Mum and Dad have arranged for you to see a therapist. His name is Jack. If he has a last name, you don't remember it. You have to see Jack twice a week, even over the summer holiday. His house is just outside of town. You talk in a small room with a horrible multicoloured rug. Mum and Dad have to wait in another room on the other side of the house. Jack asks you a lot of questions about school, about your parents, whether they have ever hurt you, which they haven't, whether you have ever hurt anyone, which you haven't, except when you kicked Jeremy Bagshaw in the arse whilst running down a flight of stairs, which you say was an accident both times. Both times, says Jack. He writes something down. You haven't hurt any animals either, not even by mistake. And you're not keeping secrets from anyone or for anyone. Jack opens a desk drawer and retrieves your Garfield notebook. It now has lots of brightly coloured tabs between the pages. Anthony, says Jack. You say you're not keeping secrets, but... You still won't admit to writing any of these stories. I don't know, but that seems to me like maybe Anthony is keeping some secrets from Anthony, if you know what I mean. You don't know what he means. Jack draws a picture of two stick men. He writes Anthony under both of them. This doesn't make things any clearer. Jack crosses it out again. I think, says Jack, maybe you wrote these stories when you were upset about something. But then, maybe, the thing you were upset about ended up upsetting you so much that you 
forced yourself to forget about it. Which means perhaps if we found a way to help you remember writing these stories, we can also help you remember the thing that upset you in the first place. Because that other Anthony, the one that wrote those stories, he's still inside you somewhere. I just want to help bring him out. And then there can be one whole Anthony once more. Jack shows you a page from the Garfield notebook. It's a short paragraph about a guy going to greet a girl called Cecilia, but then both of their heads get lopped off by a loose helicopter blade. You don't like the story much. It's kind of horrible, actually. And sad. Really sad. It's not the kind of stuff that you write at all. You hand the book back to Jack. I didn't write that, you say. Does it look like your handwriting, says Jack. Yeah, you say. A, a little bit. Jack fishes around in a carrier bag and pulls out another book. In fact, it's a brand new Garfield notebook, exactly the same size and cover as your old one. Presumably your parents told Jack which shop sells them in town. So, says Jack, I had an idea. Sometimes the best way to remember something is to do it again. So, you see this story about the helicopter accident? I'd like you to try copying out this story, moving it from your old book to this brand new book. How does that sound? You don't say anything. The reason being, says Jack, I think maybe by writing it out again, you might possibly start to remember the first time you wrote it. And with that, you might even remember what inspired it in the first place. And that would be good, wouldn't it? So... You go home, sit at the kitchen table with mum and dad and write out the story about the helicopter, line by line. Next session, Jack asks you to write out another story and every session after, until you have copied out every gruesome story in the notebook, none of which you have any memory of writing even now. Jack keeps the original book in his office, but he lets you take the new one home with you. Just in case it sparks any memories, he says. Sooner or later, whatever it is that you're bottling up is going to come back to you, Anthony. And when it does, I'll be here to listen. Whenever it's time to leave his house, Jack has you do a fist bump with him. Which is the saddest thing that has ever happened in the world. Sadder than any story you could ever write in your book. Shortly after... The stories start working their way into your sleep. You have recurring dreams of sudden bloody endings. You dream of choosing the wrong door and falling into a pit of snakes, or trying to deactivate a killer robot with a spoon and getting your head crushed in. One night, you dream of drinking a mug of acid but before the liquid can burn out your insides, Dad shakes you awake and picks you up out of bed. The entire house smells like rotten eggs. Dad carries you downstairs into the garden. Mum is already out there, both her and Scotty standing on the grass in their pyjamas. Once Scotty stops coughing, Mum puts him down. She kneels in front of you. Anthony, says Mum, tell me honestly. I won't be angry. Was it you? Or was what me, you say? Did you get up in the night and turn the stove gas on? She holds you tightly by the arm. Tell me the truth, says Mum. Was it you? To tell your mum that you didn't maliciously flood the house with natural gas, turn to page 17. To tell your mum that you don't remember what you did, turn to page 17. To tell your mum you did flood the house with gas, but you don't know why, 
turn to page 17. To ask your mum why the hell would anyone want to flood the house with gas, turn to page 17. To say nothing, turn to page 17. To climb over the back fence, turn to page 17. To claw at your own forehead, turn to page 17. Page 17. Whatever you decide to do, you do it. Shortly after, mum and dad arranged for you to see a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist works at a residential centre. It's a 45 minute drive from the house. Apparently, a bunch of kids live at the centre full time, although you don't see anyone else during your visit just a couple of adults with lanyards. The psychiatrist looks a bit like Shrek. In your head, he is Shrek. Anthony, say Shrek. I know a lot of new things have happened this year. Shrek talks about your recent mood swings, your poor sleeping habits, your violent fantasies. He has a file in front of him. In the file, you can see some photocopied pages from your notebook. It's hard to tell Shrek that you didn't write those stories because, well, technically, you did write those stories, didn't you? I mean, you copied them out because Jack told you to. So you kind of both wrote them and also didn't write them? You decide it's best not to answer the question at all. After 30 seconds of silence... Shrek nods. It's like he heard an answer, even though you didn't say anything. Right then, says Shrek. I've got a questionnaire for you, Ant. It's absolutely essential that you answer these questions as honestly and thoughtfully as you can. Because how I help you really depends on what you tell me. It's all in your hands, Ant. You lead the way, and we will follow. You pick up the pen and start writing. Turn to page 21. Page 18. After carefully evaluating the group of objects on the table, you decide to pick up the copper key. As soon as you touch it, a fatal dose of electricity flashes up your arm and explodes your heart. You fool, grins the leprechaun as you slump to the floor. Of course the key was booby-trapped. Did you forget? Copper conducts electricity. <laughs> you are dead. And without you to save it, the world is doomed. All shall burn in the fires of endless night, the end. Page 19. You decide not to disturb the bird's nest. Instead, you climb back down the tree. Reaching the ground, you turn to tell your companions. But they are all gone. All life on Earth. Vaporised. Rufus activated the machine after all. Maybe you could have stopped him if you hadn't spent so long messing around with birds' nests. But now, it is too late. You took too long. The end. Page 20. You pick up the chair and smash the control panel. As you do this, the space station view screen flickers to life. On the screen, a young girl with red hair appears. My name is Cecilia, says the girl. Stranger, we've never met, but I am indebted to you. Thank you for saving our people. All that remains now is for you to type the word cancel into the control panel. This will deactivate the nuclear bomb beneath the citadel, but be quick, stranger. We have less than a minute. You look down 
at the destroyed control panel, fizzing with sparks. Uh, you're typing it, says Cecilia. You, you don't seem to be typing anything. You don't know what to do, so you mime typing on the destroyed keyboard. What are you doing? Says Cecilia. The screen fills with light. The connection is severed. Well, you think. That's that. The space station shudders. Its orbit is collapsing. In less than ten minutes, it will be pulled into the sun. You leave the control room and go back to your quarters. You climb into bed, get under the covers, and wait for your body to explode in a fire. The end. Page 21. A week after filling out the questionnaire, you and your parents go back to see Shrek. Shrek hands out some plastic cups of water and explains his recommendation. You're going to be put on a mild antipsychotic to see if that leads to any improvements. Shrek advises you to stay off school for a little while until you adjust to the medication. It might take a couple of weeks. Maybe three weeks at the most. If there isn't a parent who can stay home to look after you, you have the option to come and spend a couple of weeks living as a guest here at the centre. You don't have to interact with lots of people, says Shrek. You can just sleep in a comfy bed, have three square meals, watch some movies, and let the medication settle. We can keep a close eye on you, have a little chat every day, and mum and dad can visit... As much as they want, after two to three weeks, you go home, go back to school, and everything returns to normal. Dad turns to you. Aunt, he says, what do you want? Stay home or live here at the centre for a while? If you'd rather be home, I'm sure me or mum could take the time off work. You tell your parents what you want to do. Turn to page 22. Page 22. You wake in your room at the residential centre. Someone knocks, then enters. It's a young man with a lanyard bringing you your medication. If you refuse your medication, go back to page 22. If you take your medication, go forward to page 23. Page 23. You wake in your room at the residential centre. Someone knocks, then enters. It's a young man with a lanyard bringing you your medication. If you refuse your medication, go to page 23. If you take your medication, go forward to page 24. Page 24. You lie in your room at the residential centre. Your head feels like peeling paint. You want to sleep, but you can't, so you go back into the atrium and pick another DVD. The selection is okay. For some reason, there are four copies of Iron Man 2. Every time you think about Iron Man 2, you feel like you want to cry, and you're not quite sure what that's all about. You ask the lady on the front desk if you can have pen and paper. You tell her you want to write some stories. The lady disappears for a moment, then comes back and says, Maybe. She just has to check with someone who isn't available right now. You ask the lady if you can have your mobile phone. The lady says they're all in a box and she doesn't have the key, sadly. You go back to your room and accidentally throw up over your bed. A guy with a lanyard cleans you up and gives you a can of coke. Don't thank me, mate, he says. Thank your parents. It all goes on their bill. After he leaves, you lie on your fresh, clean bed and have a little strategic cry to help you get to sleep.
Go to page 26. Page 25. You stand completely still and observe the fox sitting at the bottom of your garden. The fox looks back at you. He is swiveling. Your garden looks beautiful in the moonlight. Frost glitters on every blade of grass. You hold your breath, stand up from the swing, and slowly begin walking towards it. The fox reacts, but it doesn't run. It slowly turns and trots away, heading towards a hole in the far fence. You stop moving. To your surprise, the fox stops too. It looks back at you, almost to check that you are still there. You start your approach again. Satisfied, the fox continues also. You follow the fox through the hole in your back fence. Behind the house, the undergrowth is thick. Ahead of you, you can still hear the rustle of the fox. Even when it's too dark to see anything, you can still follow the sound. After a while, the undergrowth recedes. You find yourself in a clearing. Tall trees on all sides. Bare branches reaching up like the sky was a frozen lake about to splinter into thousands of pieces. You take your phone from your pocket and turn on the torch function. In the centre of the clearing, there is a huge black boulder, about as tall as you are. You put your bare palm against it. The surface is so cold, your hand sticks to it for a second. Something inside you knows that this rock is special. That if you could move this rock in some way, you would find a door hidden beneath it. An escape hatch leading to another world. A place far away from here. A future you can't possibly imagine. Beyond the puzzle of this rock, an adventure awaits you. And yet, the rock is so heavy, so impossibly absolute, that there seems to be no solution. Perhaps there is a word, a secret word, that on speaking will cause the rock to shift. If you do not know the word now, maybe it is just not the right time. But maybe you can come back here again when you are older. Sooner or later, you will find a way through. If you do know the word and wish to speak it, turn to page 25,208. Otherwise, to return to your garden, turn back to page 10. Page 26. You wake in your room at the residential centre. It's still really early. You go through to the atrium. There's an older girl watching cartoons on the sofa. Are you okay? She says. No, you say. You tell her that you want your notebook back, but it's locked in the office somewhere. The girl gives you a lanyard. It's a spare, she says. Just put it back in the help desk drawer when you're done with it. You use the lanyard to unlock Shrek's office. You quickly grab your Garfield notebook and a pen. Then you return to the atrium, sit at a table, 
and start writing. What you're doing, says the girl. Writing a story, you say. About what, says the girl. It's about being trapped. Sounds good, says the girl. Then, after a pause, she adds, Can I be in it? All right, you say. Even though the story is sad, it feels good to write it down. Like a rock has been lifted off your brain. Hey, says the girl. Snow. You turn to the window. Seems to be coming down pretty fast. You don't know exactly how long you've been here. More than two weeks, you're sure, but three weeks feels even longer, if you're honest with yourself. After all, if it's snowing, it, 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 it must be nearly Christmas. Then again, it doesn't really matter how long you've been here, you think. However long it is, it's time for you to go home. Whatever Shrek thinks, whatever mum and dad thinks, none of that matters. It's time to go home. You pack your rucksack. Use the spare lanyard on the front door. Then post the lanyard back through the letterbox. For a minute, you just sit on the bench outside the centre and get your thoughts together. The snow is already settling underfoot. Your breath hangs in the air like cigarette smoke. Just think about mum and dad. They visited you all the time in the centre, like two, three evenings a week, always asking questions. How do you feel? How do you feel? Over and over, like they were bouncing a ball against a brick wall. Sometimes it's hard to even picture their faces, to imagine them in your head without hearing those questions. It would be nice, you think, to have a little bit longer before the questions start up again. And so, even though you're a long way from home, you decide you'd rather make your own way back rather than call mum and dad and ask for a pickup. You came here on the motorway. This is a straight line. You can just follow the same road back again. The simplicity of the plan puts a spring in your step. You even catch yourself smiling. No more questions. Not yet. No decisions need to be made. The future is a single path. All you need to do is take it. And maybe, who knows, maybe by the time you get home, maybe everything will be back to normal again like it was before, as if the snow could settle on these memories, burying them under a blanket of nothingness, returning everything to the blank page. Maybe this time, the past will stay forgotten. As you walk along the side of the motorway, you make a short list of the things you know to be true. You are good. You are free. You are ant. And you are walking a long straight road that will eventually lead you home. Now, turn to page one. So, that is the end of the Imaginary Vice podcast for another month. This month's story, You Are Ant, was written, performed and produced by me, Ross Sutherland. There was some additional score by Jeremy Wormsley. Thanks, Jeremy. For more of Jeremy's music, go to jeremywormsley.com. Um, 
if you're interested. I experimented with taking the uh, uh, this month's story and feeding it into a text adventure program. So if you'd like to actually play the interactive elements of this story, uh, like a computer game, uh, you can do that. And there's a link to the text adventure version in the show notes of this episode. Now, of course, uh, a computer game version, it, it hides away all the unchosen pages and obviously, you know, it conceals all the gruesome dead ends as well. So it makes the whole story a, um, it's a completely different experience. But still, I think for anyone curious, it's an interesting secondary way to experience the story and uh, like the sort of looping narrative aspects are sort of a lot clearer um, in the uh, the computer game version. Plus, stripping away all the alternate choices makes it a lot easier to follow Ant's story. So I do think it's useful also for kind of comprehension purposes. Anyway, <laughs> I really enjoyed trying out this experiment. Um, that's what imaginary advice is uh, about for me, really. Just kind of smashing things together and seeing what happens. I may be showing my age a bit with the references this month because talking tapes and choose your own adventure novels were both like very much products of the late 80s early 90s but uh, i hope even if you've never experienced uh, either of those forms of media before firsthand you can still immediately intuit why they would absolutely not go together and should never be brought together ever again um sorry but my voice this month i don't like i was literally fine completely fine until i had to start recording now I sound like the, the raspy guy that tries to talk to you in uh, the, the, the urinal of a bar at midday. I, I don't know where this has come from. <clears throat> anyway, if you're new to this podcast, um, Imaginary Advice is an anthology series. Most episodes are standalone and can be listened to in any order, including this one. There are no adverts. Imaginary Advice is funded entirely through listener donations. It's just my Patreon. That's it. It covers all this. So Patreon supporters who donate $5 or more get access to a bonus podcast where I talk about the writing and development process of the series. I take an old story from the feed and talk about it with a special guest. Uh, that series is called Imaginary Reprise. So you get access to the entire back catalogue of that. Um, and then there are uh, more perks for larger Patreon donations, uh, one of which is like an annual essay film, or you can also you can commission an original poem written by me as well. Anyway, for all the information, about supporting the show and what you can get back go to patreon.com p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash ross g sutherland that's all one word and that's all from me uh my name is ross sutherland till next time <laughs>